Now we will be looking at the use in planning set of analyses. And as you um, will notice, if you look at the titles of these, um, two of these are very much in development because they are looking at the ways in which services and supports are related to needs. Um, and you'll see what I mean by that a little bit once we hop in and look at the different views of the data that have been created. Um, <clears throat> so let's start with this first one called individual recommendations. So what this is trying to do um, is really just to provide a prototype um, this is not nearly as useful as it could be because as you note, there's an individual, like you can select an individual up on the top here. But as I said earlier, there's no personally identifiable health information shown on this site. So this individual is a completely made up ID that is just um, a random set of digits and um, can't be traced back to that person. So it doesn't actually help you to integrate the data into that person's plan. Instead, what we're trying to do here is to say, um, can we design a way that, that, that the data could be meaningfully used in something like an EMR or in something like, um, you know, in so, so, some other system that does allow you to access that person level detail. Um, so here, so we have a set of instructions which are really just, um, you know, some limitations for how uh, for using the data in person-centered planning, the the use case behind using it in person-centered planning, and that's really what what drove the development of this um, prototype here, is that supports coordinators would um, consistently bring up, okay, you're asking me to use this data to inform my the plan that I'm developing with the person um, and and yet I'm finding it difficult to get a clear summary with in my li in the limited time that I have available that really helps me to focus on the issues that I need to, that I would want to address and that the person might find relevant in the pre-planning session as we're deciding what to bring up in the person-centered planning um, meeting, and then which will beyond, which will you know beyond that even, be transitioned over into authorizations for services where where those are medically necessary. So, this barrier of you know taking all of that really rich data from the SIS assessment and just culling out and distilling the pieces that are the most relevant for the person-centered planning process. Um, that's what we're trying to do here. And what we're doing on this first screen is just pulling out areas from the support needs section. So basically this is coming from sections two and three, if you remember that distinction from earlier, um, from, from either the support needs sections or the protection and advocacy section. And we're pulling out only items that the person said were important to them or that one of the other um, resources and informants who were there for the assessment, like a family member or um, other staff members who work with a person, um, that they said were important for the person, right? So the options here are either it was important to the person and for the person um, just for the person, which means the person didn't endorse it, but somebody else who was with them did, and, or to the person, which means that the person endorsed it and others did not. So, so here we're just pulling out items that have that are checked as being important um, and marked as important during the SIS assessment. Now, obviously, that's a point in time assessment. What's important to a person can change from day to day, even. Um, but you know, over the course of a year or something, the that information on what's important to the person um, can certainly change. So relying too much on that is a bit risky. Um, so what else is shown here? So we're pulling out just the area of need and the name of the need. So this is really just the the question. It's shorthand of the que of the question that a person responded to. And here we're also just looking and sorting in the order of the intensity of that need. 
And like we said before, that the intensity of the need um, or the what causes the score on a given question to be higher or lower is a combination of these three things. Um, of course, I don't think everybody sort of intuitively knows what a 12 is or a 9 is and what that means. So we include here just spelling it out. So the type of support would be full physical support hourly for over four hours per day. Um, for this, etc. And then you can just go down the line and look at the intensity of the support need for each of these needs that were identified as important to or for the person. Um, next, we allow jumping into the medical and behavioral needs. So that's a separate section, as we had identified before. And here, for this individual, there's one medical or behavioral need, and that's um, transferring. And they had a score of one for some support needed. So a supports coordinator could then take that and say, all right, we might want to incorporate that into the plan as well. Um, or at least talk to the person during the pre-planning meeting about whether they want that included. And we also gave uh, the ability to view items that were related specifically to personal care or CLS services, if that's relevant or to identify any relevant services um, that are potentially relevant to the needs that are addressed by the CIS. So all of these um, needs that are noted here, it's worth saying, you know, as sort of a caveat that this by no means implies that there's automatic medical necessity around these needs. Instead, we're just trying to create an initial view of um, the sort of menu of services that could be considered and that might be relevant to the specific needs that the CIS is addressing. It certainly isn't meant as, a, as something that's limiting but as something that's helping to focus in on the most relevant um, and draw those to the person's attention to help with to help with those decisions and those conversations as part of pre-planning. And then the last thing that we included on here was um, a note regarding potential referrals. So it's possible that um, you know, based on the needs identified, that you might want to have additional a referral for a more in-depth assessment based on some of the needs that were identified in the CIS. So in this case, that transferring need that comes from um, the medical and behavioral section prompts, um, prompts the individual to consider a referral to physical therapy for an assessment. So anyway, these are, as I said, this is a prototype, it's in development, and it's meant really to spur thinking about how this information could and should be used as part of, um, as part of the person-centered planning process. And we absolutely welcome thoughts and ideas and tweaks because this is by no means finished. The next thing on this analysis page that we wanted to look at is more of a summary. So we just um, got done looking at a prototype of these individual recommendations that looks at the individual level. What we're doing here is a little bit more at the summary level. Um, so here we really just have a set of charts. So what we're looking at here is the number of people who have a need and this is really just a bar chart that's showing what are the needs that come up most often, right? So if we take out the nuns, we have, so here's the number of people with this need and then the type of need that they have. So you can see the different colors correspond to the type of need that you're familiar with from the other section. And this lets us look all in one view at the number of people who have each of these different types of needs. Um, if you wanna just filter it for things that a person said were important to them, you can do that. You can click any of these options. Um, and then you can also look at the average level of the need, right? Because 
there might be a need, but it might be relatively low. So the average level of the need, this gives the ability to um, to look at which needs have, on average, the highest um, amount of need. This next one lets us look at the number of people who in their assessment had a particular type of need marked as important either to them or for them. Um, so the total up here, so here this is about, you know, just less than 10,000 recreation, the number one important to or for need. And then not surprisingly, preferred activities. It's also worth noting that you can sort of get a sense of what the comparative ranking of these items are. So many more people noted that preferred activities were, import were important to them um, than people who noted that these were important for them. Similarly, some of these items, per personal hygiene, a lot more respondents thought that this was important for a person than the person themselves said, this is important to me. And this is something that's you know worth keeping in mind when we're thinking about how to use a tool like this and these sorts of responses in person-centered planning and in prioritizing goals that are important to the person themselves. We also have just a brief summary of items from that section three. This is just the number of times. Um, so in, some, in the way that the CIS is um, sort of the rules for administering the CIS or the suggestions that come along with it, um, the idea is that, as noted here, the four t top items in this section of the CIS should be included in person-centered planning. So this is the number of times that um, a particular item from this section of the assessment was part of that top four. So this is the number of times that these items from the protection and advocacy section um, met that threshold of being in an individual person's top four and therefore um, being recommended that those be included in person-centered planning process. So those are these sort of a little bit higher level aggregate items. And we're going now to go into yet another in development section. And this is another one that gets back to um, the, the very complex um, question of how best to to relate all of these needs. So obviously if you ask, I mean, if you ask anybody in UM, so utilization management teams are, I think, uh, the sort of the population of individuals who really started asking questions around this. And while it's been made very clear that, um, you know, a certain score on the sit on like the support needs index shouldn't be like a one-way ticket to um, a certain type of service what's clear is that all of the is that services should be related to an individual person's needs and yet not every service is related to every need so what people asked us to do is to start thinking through how would we understand the ways in which the available services under the Medicaid behavioral health benefit um, could potentially be related to the needs identified by the CIS assessment? And again, this is all potentially because it doesn't um, guarantee medical necessity just because a certain score gets reached and the information needs to be used in concert with other information about the person. But as a way to start trying to understand the way that needs and services are related, what we did was develop this, um, this visualization, which um, 
also takes some getting used to, so we're going to dive into it piece by piece. It's called a network map. And a lot of times these are used to look at relationships between people who are on social media, um, the ways that just any type of um, relationship between any pair of individuals or any pair of things, um, the way that those relationships happen in a larger network of relationships. So here we're looking at the network of relationships between needs, which are the blue nodes, and services, which are the yellow nodes. Now the size of a node for services, um, all, all the nodes for needs are the same size. The size of a node for services corresponds to the number of different needs that can be addressed using that service. So you'll see that there are some large services and there are some small services. Um, the size of the, so the band that connects the nodes to each other, so you'll notice that you know, some of these have relatively thick bands and some of them have relatively thin bands. The width of that band corresponds to the number of people who have that need. And obviously, if you select um, your region, that should show you the number of people in your particular region or CMH who have that need. If you click on a particular service or need, it should highlight all the relationships, right? So here we're looking at one of these um, one of these services that's related to a lot of different needs. And if we zoom in, we can see why. So this is supported housing per diem, right? So the large ones here are really CL, like are really um, residential and either per diem or per 15 minute CLS. So by looking at that, you can see, all right, like, so these are services obvi obviously that um, are related to and can address a multitude of different types of need. If we look towards the outs if we look towards the outside, well actually let's so let's look at a particular need that's addressed by one of these, right? So here we're looking at um, per diem CLS. And one of the things that that's related to is, so we've said all right, per diem CLS is related to maybe changing job assignments or to what else can we find here? Um, or to volunteering. So if we said, all right, a person has a need in the area of volunteering and they're receiving that, you could also say what other types of services are related to that need. So you can kind of leapfrog around and say, okay, so while this service relates to a whole lot of needs, there are other services as well that can be used to address that need. And it allows sort of a more of like a menu approach potentially when trying to connect needs to, service, to services. Another thing that we can look at using a graph like this is to say, all right, what are the needs that don't really have too many different types of services that can be used to address them, right? So these ones on the outside, so when we say, see something blue and it's just sort of sitting out here on the outside of this graph, um, what that means is that we have not yet identified very many services that can be used to address that need. And those areas require a different type of attention. Now it's possible that you know, there aren't many services because there really aren't many applicable services um, and that usually the, those needs are taken care of by a natural support network. But this is a way at least to see whether or not um, whether or not there are available services that relate specifically to that need. If we look over here, for instance, on this side, you can see physical fitness is related to a range of OT and PT related services, as well as moving about.
and that those particular types of services weren't really really identified as being relevant to too many needs other than those needs which were identified by the CIS. And then you can also see a few areas where there really is there really is only one service that's related to a given need. So this is a way of visualizing, at least to start out, the complex relationship between needs and services. And if nothing else, it begins to sort of to point to the complexity of a sort of one size fits all approach as opposed to looking at the menu of available services related to a given need. Um, but as noted, this is something that's very much in development and um, we welcome any feedback, any lines that we missed drawing connecting a particular need to a service, welcome feedback on that as well. And um, this, is, this also is really just in the very beginning stages.